<laughs> Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And um, uh, welcome, welcome back. It's been a month. Uh, it feels weird now. We only do the monthly. I miss Craig terribly in, in that month. <laughs> I must confess. Uh, yeah, it's episode episode fifty four, and um, it's uh, our, our topic of discussion is research methods, statistics. But but before that, make you tune out. It's for the clinician. And Craig and I wanted to do an episode on this for some time, but we were a bit worried that it wasn't one that was going to be popular or well subscribed to. And we were pretty convinced when we decided we were just going to do it anyway, that, that Rod was the only real person that we, we, we wanted to come on and do it. Huge fans of his work. I don't know if anyone's seen his, his talks that he gives at Aspatar uh, out in Qatar uh, that, that then get put onto YouTube. But if you haven't after this, go, go and look for them because he does some brilliant talks there. And uh, Rod, thank you so much for, for joining us for this episode and, um, and sharing our concerns that it would be a worrying topic to approach, but we think we can make it fun. We think we can make it applicable to, to the, the clinicians. And that's kind of where I want to start in that there's a lot of people that aren't fans of research. And, and you could argue on the one hand that if you're a clinician, you, don't, you, don't, you shouldn't have that choice. You've got, to, you've got to get involved in it in some way. You don't have to be an academic. You don't have to be a researcher. But if you're a clinician, even if you'd refer to yourself as a cold faced clinician, you, you've got to get involved in, in reading research at some stage in your life. And actually, even as a as a non clinician, just just having a better uh, understanding of how to read things and how to appraise things and, and things. You could argue as a nation, if we were better at doing that, we, we you know, not just believing things that were told to us, we, we may we may live in a very different world. So, uh, I mean, I guess I want to start by asking you why is it why is it important that everyone has a, a good baseline understanding of, of this stuff? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Um, and maybe if we kind of flip the question around for a second and figure out a case where it wouldn't matter, like no one needs to know it. And I reckon if your caper podiatry or my caper physio or whatever else, if all the questions had been answered and basically we had this stuff cracked fifty years ago and we, we knew the best treatments and the best outcomes and the best everything, then there'd be no need to read the research. But if you think that your profession is moving forwards and new things are coming out and you've got to try and sift the wheat from the chaff or find out what are the good things, then you've got to know, well, what's rubbish and what's real. And then the next one that usually comes up, again, when I have these same discussions, is, um, well, look, I, I'm not a researcher, you know, I'm just a clinician. I can't be expected to know that kind of stuff. And, yeah, I get that point. You know, you were trained and your whole job is doing your technical skills and all the rest of it. But the problem is it's, it's way easier to teach you as the clinician enough about statistics, not to be a statistician, but enough about statistics to be able to read your papers than it is to teach a statistician how to be a podiatrist or a physio or a whatever. So the example we were just chatting about before, and this actually happened uh, just a little while ago here, um, you know, one of the areas we look at a lot is training load and somebody had some training load da data, they shot it off to a statistician and the results came back were a bit queer. You know, we just, uh, that doesn't seem right, but you know, the numbers are the numbers. You know, do you mind if I just have a look at that? And there was a whole bunch of training load data that had been put in as zero. And, you know, this is for session RPE. And it's like, mate, you can't have zero. You can't go to training and have a zero value for your training. You have some amount of minutes and, you know, you at least say it was one out of 10. Well, and it turned out that, you know, just there was some missing data. It was entered as zero. The statistician said, oh, well, it must have been zero training. That's it. Away we shoot he has no way of knowing that that's, that just can't happen in that field because he doesn't know training load stuff and nor should he be expected to. Otherwise he'd have to know surgery and radiology and all the other things he's expected to do. But you as the podiatrist or as the whoever would be able to not make those silly little mistakes. So if you know enough about the stats and you say, look, I've kind of had a look at it like this and I think that, and I do that, you're already a long way ahead of the game. And then if you were to take it to a statistician and say, mate, here's what I think, tell me why I'm wrong, then, you know, you're really going to get a long way ahead. So long answer to your short question, why do we really need to know about it? Well, if you think your profession is changing, you're going to have to know about stats to be able to know if your stuff is working and what stuff is right and what stuff isn't. And as things are going forward, it's gone to the days when we could say, look, I just do this because I know it works because governments and insurers and people like that are really starting to say, 
well, hang on a second, it's a market out there. We've only got this much cash. Should we be spending it on podiatrists or on massage or on aromatherapy or on whatever the case may be? And you, we're going to all have to put up or shut up. And this is the only way for us to do it. Yeah, perfect. And, and it's interesting, isn't it, that at some point in our life, we we sort of abandon the scientific method a little bit. I, I, I've got two young kids and basically I watch them and every single day I watch them and I see that they, they're they just thinking like scientists. They're questioning everything way yeah. too much in my opinion. Every <laughs> single thing around, every single thing in life is an experiment to them. And one, you know, one of them, regardless of his hypothesis, the way he tests it is it goes in his mouth. And you just, you don't <laughs> want, you don't want to, you don't want to sort of quash that. And at some point, I don't know when it is or why we just we stop questioning things and we start believing what we're told and we yeah. believe the headlines or the whether it's a newspaper or a blog or an abstract uh, you know uh, and they all merge I, I guess uh, nowadays uh, we need to have these skills to like you say no are we going to adopt a new modality are we going to believe that barefoot running is the next, the next best thing why do you think do you have any thoughts on, on you know you surround yourself with with scientists and of all types why do you think we just that gets beaten out of us as we as we grow why, why as kids are we so inquisitive and at what point do we just start being okay with accepting things and not questioning them yeah i guess i mean it's it's easier to take a shortcut sometimes like in, and you you're a bit of a prick if you're constantly that guy who's no nah, no nah, that's wrong i don't believe anything and <laughs> You know, so I, I guess hey, that's Craig, that. Craig you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Australians generally, but Craig in particular. <laughs> no, I get, uh, and you know, it's 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 often just easier to oh look, it's all too hard. Just tell me the answer, you know. And that's one of our yeah. dramas with stats is, and maybe we'll get onto p values and things like that at some stage. But that was just look. This, this all seems difficult, you know, is it this, is it that? You're telling me on the one hand this, on the other. I just want a simple answer. Just tell me yes or no, this works or it doesn't work. Just, just drill it down to that and that's all I want to know. And look, it's never like that. You know, you have to be able to get to the point where you can say, well, it's this versus it's that. And that's why you've got to be able to read those different things. Yeah. Actually, yeah. Another, actually, Ian, going back to your first question, another way to answer that is, um, well, we don't have a choice. Our regulatory and licensing authorities tell us we have to. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, like, it's, <laughs> you know, you can argue it however they want, but, you know. The, you, it's, but I, I, I guess at that point, people say, right, I better keep abreast of the research because I'm duty bound to, and, you know, like CPD is mandatory. And then they're keeping abreast of the research is, is reading the last line of an abstract. Um, and okay, yeah. you know that, that isn't the same thing, is it? Looking at a paper and you know trying to get a feel for its strength, its robustness. Again, we'll come on to these things uh, in mm. just a second, but they're, they're the skills that we seem to to either yearn or ignore and kind of go, well, they don't apply to me. Let, let's kind of try and keep this as applicable as yeah. possible to uh, to clinicians, particularly. Um, so we pick up a paper, Rod. We decide, right. Let's get stuck in whether we're an undergrad and we're currently studying or we're postgrad or whether we are returning to work after a layoff. Let's say someone would consider themselves rusty or novice like in their ability to to read and appraise research. So they, they decide they want to get into this, but they're nervous and they're worried. They pick up a paper. Have you got some some sort of not, not shortcuts because we don't like that word, but some top tips? You know, where does your mind go first if you want a, a quick and dirty way of saying, right, how do I apply? see if this paper's robust where, where should i look what are my what are my tips where where do i start what do you think about that well let's get to the robust later because i reckon that's um that's kind of step two uh step one let me just share my screen here with you um yep we'll give you that one and this is kind of if you want an algorithm or something thing one is we've got to figure out how big is this effect and that's and usually if it's you know, you're just looking at a cohort study. So they just took a bunch of people and they followed them over time or they did something and they said they were like this and they ended up like that. All right, well, how much did it change? Or we've got two treatment groups, you know, this treatment versus that treatment. Well, and they're saying that this one's better than that one. Well, how much better? And we'll get on to how you do that in a moment. But step one is you've got to be able to figure out how big is that effect. And then you have to express that in terms that matter to the patient to you as the clinician 
and to parents, coaches, governments, insurers, whatever the case may be, whoever are the people you think these are the people that matter, right? Is that actually a big effect? If that effect is small, stop there because it doesn't matter if it's a wonderful, robust study or whatever else. All you're going to be reading that paper for is to say this doesn't matter. And if it's terrible methods and it's a small effect, you still think it doesn't matter. If it's fantastic methods and it's a tiny effect, you still think it doesn't matter. So stop there. In the unlikely event that there's a huge effect, then you've got to say, well, hang on, how noisy is this thing that we measured? You know, just what happened there? And if we get a chance to have a look at that in a moment, we'll, we'll do that. And if it turns out that there's no noise in the measure and you've got a huge effect, mate, you could be onto something here. This one could be real. And then we'd go through all that other stuff you were saying. Is this robust? Is it in patients like my patients? Blah, 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 blah. Likewise, if there's loads of noise or you have no idea of knowing, is this a reliable measure? Is it a good measure or whatever the case may be? Now we're in that gray zone. I don't know if it's good. I don't know if it's bad. Rinse and repeat if it's a medium sized effect. But just remember now your bar is going to have to be a little bit higher to figure stuff out. A medium sized effect and it's a really noisy measure. Eh, probably I'm not going to be paying too much attention to that one. Then you've got to figure out as well, okay, we, we've said this is maybe a big effect. What else do we know about it? Um, what's the up and downside of doing this particular thing? You know, is this just giving somebody a pamphlet or five minutes of advice over the phone? That probably hasn't got a whole lot of downside, but maybe doing surgery, that does have a whole lot of downside. You probably want to be able to weigh that up. Who are these blokes who are doing, or people who are doing this thing? You know, are they trying to sell you something? You can't avoid that sort of stuff now. And is there any way, I, especially, is there some way I could realistically check this in my practice and trust what's going on? So they're saying it really helps if I put this kind of dressing on a wound. All right, well, you know, we're currently doing something similar to that. Maybe I'll do the same thing and see if I get similar kinds of results and then we'll have a little bit of a think about it and take it from there. So that'd kind of be my overview of, you know, what really matters with this stuff. And where would you go? Superb. Um, can you just, someone's just messaged me and said, what, what do you mean by noise? Can you just clarify what you mean by that, Rod? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, so this gets wildly under-investigated, um, but it's, it's actually really important. It used to be, like when I first started out, it was reliability trials got published all the time. And nowadays, you can never get a reliability trial published, but they're actually really important. And the guts of a reliability trial is that you just do something, you do no intervention, and sorry, you, you take some measure, you do no intervention, and then you just measure it again. So um, what's an example? Your bathroom scales are possibly not the most reliable piece of equipment on the world. So you stand on them and it says you are, I don't know, 78 80, kilos? 81, 81, uh, 81. Uh, that's with the jersey <laughs> though. Right, so, it says you're, <laughs> so it says you're 81 kilos, you get off, and it says you're 81.2 kilos, you get off, it says you're 79.8 kilos, and you can do some maths and some formula and figure out, and you can say, look, this thing that shouldn't have changed weight in the three seconds between getting off and getting on, my device here says that it is changing weight, so that's part of the measurement error. And that's depending on the device that you're using, you know, it's going to have a certain amount of measurement error. Mostly in our caper though, the error comes from the patient. So I get someone to do a strength test or you ask someone how they're feeling today or whatever else the case may be and everything else hasn't changed, but there's going to be some noise in how hard they push on this particular test or how they're feeling right at this moment, independent of anything else that's going wrong with them or whatever else. And there are some ways that you can go about by saying, all right, well, this is how much noise there is in that measure. You know, it, we, our best guess is you're 78 kilos, but given those scales, maybe it could be as much as 79, maybe it could be as much as 77, right? So that's our range, but that's our best kind of guess. So our noise is plus or minus one kilo, let's say. But if those scales were plus or minus 15 kilos now, and you're doing some treatment that came to... Um, make you lose 15 grams of weight, well, forget it. You are never going to be able to measure it with that tool. 
you know, and there might not be very many tools that actually could measure a change that small. Yeah, perfect. Makes sense. Um, Craig, did you, we you talk, just Rod mentioned something about addressing a diabetic dressing. I remember you saying to me you'd read, um, you'd read a paper recently. About no, it, just, it was actually just yesterday. I was just looking over a, a, a paper on diabetic foot ulcers and it was looking at low level laser therapy for diabetic foot ulcers. And it was a randomized controlled trial. My cursory look at the methods, fine. You know, outcome measures, fine. Randomization, fine, et cetera, et cetera. The stats were fine. And it showed a really big effect for it. And you, oh, ooh, yeah, wow. But then the control group was just a, a wet saline dressing. So laser ther- low-level laser therapy was extraordinarily effective compared to a saline dressing, which no one uses clinically. So my point in this discussion we had earlier on was the, the, the new treatment was compared to something that a, 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 a technique that's not used in clinical practice. Now, if they compared that new low-level laser therapy to, say, standard or what's commonly used in wound therapy, it may be no better. It may have actually been worse. We, we, we don't know. So I think that was the, the point of that, is that, that you, you, um, I'm not sure if you'd quali- how would you respond to something like that, Rod? So. Yeah, so I reckon that comes back to, well, two things I want to say about that. So firstly, it had come back to what we were saying before, you know, maybe these people, let's give them the benefit of the doubt. It's all in, you know, let's say they're not doing the payment of the people who make the laser device. They're not trying to sell you a laser device. They haven't fudged their data or anything else. Mm. And they have just sent it off to a statistician and he goes, look at this, this is fantastic. But you as a podiatrist have the domain knowledge to say, mate, no one does, what did you say, wet saline as the dressing. And this measurement that you had for how much it heals there, I know that the kind of things I normally do get a better outcome than that. Mm -hmm. So again, at the risk Mm -hmm. of um, the, the example I want to give you here is that we, we all kind of stand up to the holy grail of, you know, a randomized control trial. And we think that's going to be the thing that, and it is absolutely a randomized control trial. There's no getting around this. It is the best way to compare treatment A, treatment B and whatever else. Unfortunately, in our caper, I don't know about yours, but the, the example you just gave, this is exa- an example of shit treatment A versus shit treatment B. Mm-hmm. And, you know, shit treatment A wins, but, basically neither of those are good things to do they're not going to tell you you know what the best thing is to actually do for the patient in front of you if that outcome you know as in your case i'd say if you Mm. read through that you're probably going to say well look that low level laser therapy that's not a very big effect size in the scheme of things in terms that matter to me as a podiatrist or to that patient or the government who's potentially paying for it Actually, but isn't that the problem concerning the government that 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 kind of data is not going to be fed into a systematic review and a meta-analysis that policymakers base their decisions on? Yeah. So if (laughs) well, you're right. But if they if they were to do it properly, so if they got some podiatrists who knew the domain correctly, Mm. um, then maybe you know we would be okay. So you know that's in an ideal world, a systematic review would be we'd have a whole bunch of these things going on because we're never going to be able to do the one randomized controlled trial which gets the 73 different treatments that are available for diabetic foot ulcers, Mm. randomizes everybody to them, powers it adequately. So typically what happens is we've got a whole bunch of different fights going on in different places around the world. And, you know, this bloke beat that bloke. And then at another time, he fought against this guy, but this guy fought against. And eventually you might be able to pull all of those and put them in. And that's, you know, what these systematic reviews and meta-analyses are. But this is the drama with it, is if it's garbage in, it's garbage out. And, you know, you just, you can't polish a turd. (laughs) Johnny Johnny Anethis is the guy who talked loads about this. Um, And I'm no doubt you've come across what he was going before. But he reckons a lot of the systematic reviews and meta-analyses that we're doing, you know, we're down to about 3% of them that are actually published that are decent and clinically useful. That's the fault of the journals, um, the reviewers, and probably the supervisors who are telling their students, all right, thing one you've got to do, you've got to go and do a systematic review for me. Um, so broadly speaking, you know, everyone's got a theory for better than that are cohort studies so we took a bunch of patients and we found out what happened to them okay it's looking like out of these cohort studies laser therapy seems to have an effect this size that seems like rubbish wet saline has an effect like this that seems like rubbish 
rinse, 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 rinse. It's, hey, there's two competing ones over here. You know, this treatment and this treatment, they seem to have a much bigger effect than all the other ones. Right, now there's the time for us to do a randomized control trial to see which one wins head to head on that. And then in theory, we do a systematic review and a meta-analysis to be able to pull all of those guys in together. Um, but that's typically not how it happens, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah, actually, no. So am no. I? Oh, sorry. Sorry, go on, Craig. Go on, I was going to say, uh, oh, sorry, another potential example here is there's acupuncture. And, and you, my reading, well, I, I don't have a vested interest either way whether it works or doesn't work, but my reading of all the randomized controlled trials is it's probably no better than a placebo. But you've got the supporters of acupuncture using the fallacy of special pleading that, that are randomized controlled trials are not an appropriate way to test an intervention like acupuncture. Um, I just want, how would you respond to that kind of discussion, Rod? Yeah, my reading is probably concurs with yours, but it also gets back to um, what we were saying before about you've got to see how big the effect is mm. in terms that matter to the patient. So uh, let's, let's have a crack at that. So, and when I talk to the acupuncture people, they'll tell me that, you know, the big thing is acupuncture helps with pain. All right. Yeah. I know it can probably also fix a heart murmur and girl trouble and all sorts yeah. of other stuff. Yeah. But the big thing that it's <laughs> going to fix is pain. So um, this was a, an awesome paper. Uh, oh, and if, if it helps later, if people want any of these papers, I don't know, put them in touch and I'll send them to you and we'll pass them on. So with all the yeah. references and whatnot. So what these blokes did, this is um, pain from 2001. They measured pain in the usual way. And this was people who had had pain for a long time for lots of different reasons. And they got some treatment that changed their pain, got it better, got it worse. But also at the very end of the study, the patient was then, they went up to him and said, listen, over your, you know, your intervention today, just tell us on this scale from very much better to very much worse, what do you reckon? And this is what they found. So, on our y-axis here, we've got how much their pain changed. So up here at zero, it means obviously it doesn't change. Uh, and the different amounts depend on where your pain started. So if your baseline pain starts out at four, obviously it can't go down by more than four. You know? So depending on if your baseline pain was nine, they had 171 of these poor buggers whose pain was starting out at nine out of 10. And that's the triangles just here. So the nine out of 10 guys will say their pain is much improved if you make it better by about four and a half out of 10, about 50%. Right, uh, just let's bear that in mind for a moment. Here's one of these systematic reviews and meta-analyses and um, the, the people who like sticking needles into people tell me that um, low back and neck pain, that's it. You know, this is a really good thing to do. So here's, What's that? 48 studies in 8,000 people for neck pain and low back pain. And what did they find? They found it um, immediate. So straight away as you do it, one month later and three months later, the effect size of doing acupuncture versus pretend acupuncture is about a third of a point out of 10 and it's statistically significant. All right, well, that, that seems good. Now, if we actually take that across and do it in terms that matter to a patient, as far as patients are concerned, dropping my pain by a third out of 10, essentially irrespective of where your pain started off, you think that's no change or minimally worse. Mm. So yes, it's a real, it's a statistically significant effect. And you know, you could say, but in, so now we go and look and see how big is the effect and how big is it to the people who matter, the people who are actually doing this to, and my argument would be, well, if the patients say they're no better or maybe a little bit worse, how can you still argue that this is a good thing to get people to spend money on? Yeah. Actually, that's, that's, that's so applicable to so many other things as well. Um, yeah, well, this, this is where I get a bit dirty. So if I can stay on my high horse just for a second. <laughs> and this is where the big, why I really want people who actually treat patients to get more involved in research or at least inform the research or at least know more about it. And I blame people like me, physios who went and got PhDs. So look, and I don't know these guys, so this is my apology if they're there, but here's, count them, seven PhDs who, this is about 
sticking needles in for pain up in this area of your body. Now you're a rushed clinician and you say, listen, I, I just, I just want to know if this stuff works. I've been hearing heaps about it. Should I go and do a weekend course on it? Should I start doing this in my practice? Oh, look, there's a review in, this is a good journal in, this is in our caper, um, sports and physical therapy. Mm -hmm. What did they do? I don't really understand this, but it looks like they got 12 studies. Okay. Um, and what's it say in here now already, hopefully our alarm bells are going off because we see that this is saying that dry needling immediately is only improving pain by somewhere between just above zero and just below two, but probably it's around about one out of 10. Um, and at four weeks now we're saying maybe it's a little bit worse. Maybe it's up to a bit more too, but again, it's just about one out of 10, but probably because you haven't been taught how to read a forest plot like most of us. You jump to the conclusion and you say, now these bozos have said, we have a, a grade A, whatever the hell a grade A recommendation is, but it sounds pretty good. A grade <laughs> A recommendation for dry needling compared to sham or placebo for immediate. Well, I, I better go straight out and do one of those weekend courses in it. I mean, and you'd be perfectly entitled to think that that was real. But I guarantee you that either these guys have just got the blinkers on so much or they're not seeing patients every day. and genuinely asking them you know so what did you think about that you know and if if your patient says to you after you do something yeah, my pain was six and now it's oh, i don't know four and a half five five let's say basically they're telling you you've made no effect you know on your stat sheet it says you do and your statistician will tell you it does but that's you ought to be doing something better to get your bang for your buck it wasn't worth them getting in the car coming to your place and giving you money to get that sort of a change <laughs> yeah nice um, we've touched on so many so many words and phrases here Rod that were down on my list to talk about um, you know we've talked on the list that we, we, that we, we someone asked what effect sizes were and it, I think it's pretty clear that you hold them in high regard and that the, the one thing people should do before they read papers is get a real good grasp of effect sizes is, is that a fair um, sort of summary of the, your uh, sort of uh, thoughts on it yeah absolutely um effect sizes really matter um okay well let's let's have a little bit of a chat about it and we'll go back i just found a couple of slides on measurement error because that sort of comes into it a bit here so maybe if we if indulge me again um, just a second for yeah, that always um right so you know what we said so this idea of you know, how much is the noise that we're going to actually be able to find from time A to time B? And so usually you want to find this idea of the minimum, the smallest detectable difference, the change or whatever the noise. And that kind of study is you just take some measure, you do nothing, and then you measure the people again. So let's take, and this is some real data. So we just did time one and time two. And on the y-axis there is how strong people were when we did this. And if you just look at those two populations, to me, it looks like, geez, I don't know if I can tell if one's better than the other. This is all the people at time one at time two. So we've got some going up, some going down. But again, I'm not entirely sure what's happening there. If I have the two group averages, I say, oh, hang on a second, 224 up to 231. And this is for how strong the muscles are in the front of your thigh. And this was actually a study done by this bloke um, who was a physio, used to work at our place along with another one. Stuck in the machine, did a bunch of different things like that. And when we did the maths around this, it turned out that the smallest detectable difference, so that is you just do the test and do it again. The best way to do it was with all the different straps on. There was a bit of an argument going on at our place whether you should put all the straps on or you can get away with just sticking the ones on your legs and not put it on there. Uh, or, and there was another argument about should this, this pad go up or down your leg. Cut a long story short, the, the absolute least noisy measure for this device, which costs about uh, second hand or costs you about 30 grand, brand new will cost you about 70 grand. The best measurement has noise of about 20%. Now, not because this machine is noisy, this thing can measure to about 0.01 of a Newton metre. It's because this bloke sitting on it can't spit out exactly the same numbers each day. So you do some sort of treatment intervention, time one, time two, to say that your strengthening program worked, you've actually got to get over the hurdle of a 20% difference from time one, time two, before you can say, okay, I'm now confident that something actually happened. So, 
you know, we went from 224 to 231, but the noise in this case is about 45 Newton meters and that completely swamps uh, that group effect. And this gets, so, so this, loads of people have thought about this for a long time. You've probably heard about this thing called the normal distribution. Lots of things are normally distributed, not everything, and that's a bit of a trap, but lots of things are. So, you know, height, for example, you know, most people are average height, and as you go further up, there's fewer and fewer people who are really tall or really short. Um, and it just turns out that, with this kind of distribution, within one or one standard deviation, either way, you've got about two thirds of people go out to two standard deviations. Now you've got about 95% of people, three standard deviations, and you're up to more than 99%. So if we've got one population and they're on average like this, and they're sort of spread out like that, and we have some other population, we're trying to figure out who's strongest, or maybe this is before and after your treatment effect or whatever the case may be. And if these guys shift way over here somewhere, well, one thing you might say is, look, there's still some of these guys who are in this weaker group who are stronger than some of these guys who are in the stronger group. But on average, these guys are here and these guys are here. So remembering our normal distribution, when population shifts from there to there, one way for us to say how big that difference is, is how many standard deviations difference. And in this case, the one I've just shown you is one standard deviation difference. So that's maybe the change that we saw. And this bloke, Cohen, was the first guy to say, look, I, I get it that there's a problem with p-values. Maybe we should be starting to think about things in terms of how big the difference is. And he was the first guy who talked about effect sizes and all that this D number is. So this is a Cohen's D. So he originally just proposed three of these. And after then, people have said, all right, well, you know, let's add in some other descriptors for it and he said if you move 0.2 of a standard deviation that's small up to huge would be two standard deviations my experience now in my caper is that this um, overestimates effect sizes i reckon when we see small effect sizes they're actually trivial so things that would count as 0.2 of a standard deviation you go back to the real world and you say hey hang on a second so we come back to our, our example here, 224 up to 231. That's a difference of seven. Seven out of, let's pull those standard deviations, seven out of 10, that'd be 0.7. So Cohen would be saying that's somewhere between a medium and a large effect size. That's one way to think about it. But then we said, okay, but in terms of the noise that we saw, the noise on that device is really large, you know, 45 Newton meters. So maybe it's a medium to large effect but it's completely swamped by the noise that's going on there. So I don't know that we can entirely trust what's happening with that one. So that's, you know, part A. That's how big the changes we saw. Um, uh, actually, I don't know if you're gonna hear, uh, the, the noise in this is, it's just trying to bring home um, how different the effect size is in terms of what actually matters to different people. Um, so you can find this stuff online if you like. I've forgotten the name of the guy who first did this example. Uh, bug it if I can forget. But if we think from Jesse Owens up to Usain Bolt, you'd say it's day and night with the 100 metres. You know, they're, they're playing a completely different sport. <clears throat> but if you think about me running 5Ks around the zone here, and these were my times for 14 of these, and I can hand on heart guarantee you that I do not do any training. So my time sits around about a, a wholly unimpressive 27 minutes for 5Ks. But depending on beers or whatever else, it might be as bad as 31 something or on with wind blowing up my clacker, it might be less than 25 minutes or something like that. So the amount of noise just from test to test on me is huge. So if you were saying we're going to do some treatment effect on me, maybe do a training program or something like that, and it's going to improve my time by 1%, let's say, no, let's say 10%. So in my case, you know, 20, let's say 30 minutes, three minutes, I'd have to say that's still, you know, kind of in the realms of noise. 1%, just forget about it. But 1% for these guys, you know, 10% would be one second, 1% would be 0.1. So changing by 0.1, you know, you're going to be shifting in essence in the order of, what's that going to be? 
that's at least a couple of Olympic cycles. So 1% change for these guys is a massive effect and they'd probably be willing to undergo some sort of training program or something that did an effect like that. 1% effect for me, it's going to take an awful lot of convincing before I'd be thinking of that, you know, this is a realistic thing for me to, to be able to do. Another example that comes up in our case a lot. Oh, did you hear that sound? Yeah. What was that? Right. That was um, Jesse Owens up to Usain Bolt. Let's do it again. So that's as if you'd ran all of the Olympic winners from Jesse Owens to Usain Bolt. The first one crossing the, the finish line is Usain Bolt. The last one is Jesse Owens. Here's how big the difference is. That's it. So that's from 1936 to 2012. That's the difference we're talking. So that's when I was saying, you know, you need to think of the effect size in terms that it matters to the person that you're doing this to. So for those guys, a half a percent is probably a big deal. For this palooka, we're going to need to think about a 20% improvement before you'd say it actually matters. Um, yeah, so that, that was that example before. This is my last one because this one, um, all right, so I've got these uh, twin robots that I keep hostage in my basement and it just so turns out that when they do a single leg squat, the amount of knee valgus that they do is exactly the difference which is very statistically significant between left and right of volleyball players or very statistically significant between volleyball and bas basketball players with the amount of knee valgus that's going on. Now, I've made it a lot easier for you because these studies were done with people jumping off a box and landing on the ground. These guys are synchronized and just doing a slow single leg squat. So just um, for beers now, which one of these guys has more knee valgus? Because remember, it's this is P of 0.01. So the difference between the two of these is in the order of about, three, in fact, it's three and a half degrees. So which one of those guys is doing the three and a half degrees more knee valgus, which is highly statistically significant? Jesus, I don't know. Left, I'm, I'm, going, go, I'm going left. Craig, you go right, yeah, I'll go I, left. I, well, I think the point of the exercise is I can't really tell. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we can't see that. I don't know that Vicon can actually measure that. Um, and I certainly can't see it. I can definitely not see it with the naked eye. So, you know, putting it back in the context of, well, how am I going to do this in the clinic? So the next time you read a paper that says, you know, there was a significant increase in knee valgus or a significant increase in knee valgus was associated with patellofemoral pain or whatever the case may be, like, go and find out what the numbers are. And then, you know, do you reckon I could see that? Can I influence that? Can I change that? how much these guys are robots, so they're able to reproduce that every time you get your patients to do a squat 10 times. Do you reckon they're going to be able to do it exactly the same every time? Mm. Yeah. Um, <coughs> Rod, you, we had a few other things on the list that you've touched on where I want to come back to because you, we've talked about a bit about p-values there and you've already yep. touched on... Um, you know, that they're not magical. And one of your the videos that I watched on YouTube a while ago was was a bit of a tongue-in-cheek entitled how you can use a p-value to make it say whatever you want about your research which, uh, which i thought was great yeah. and i i was reading the sander greenland paper um on how statistical tests are misinterpreted whether it be sample size power p-values maybe we'll talk about all of these but can we start on p-values where where are we at with p-values because i read that some some journals are rejecting papers now that uh, would include p-values. Um. Yep. Yeah. So there's a bit of a push and I get it because they've been just really badly used, really badly interpreted. But the idea that they're tossing people out who are just doing p-values, I think that's gone too far the other way. Um, look, and this, this is our fault again, because, the answer almost always is it depends. You know, does low level laser therapy beat, um, what was it, Craig? Saline um, dressings. <laughs> saline dressings, you know, well, it depends. <laughs> so what patients, you know, how big an effect size, how many people did they have? Well, what, what's the deal with all those different ones? But that's a wholly unsatisfying answer. And what the person reading the paper wants to know is just tell me, mate, 
yes or no. And that's p-values came out of um, a, a push to try and get that yes or no answer. Um, and there's, and you know, to cut a long story short here, we are not going to solve the p-value discussion here right now. But if people listening to this at least take out of this that the p-value does not mean that this treatment was better than that treatment, that this had a big effect, that this had anything else, we're ahead of the game by a long way. Um, so if you were to go back and at least look at the numbers, then we could start to interpret the p-value. The, there's a couple of, the couple of issues around p-values that maybe it's worth taking a crack at. So if, if you get lost in this next little bit, don't worry, you're not Robinson Crusoe in that regard. Um, but yeah, anyway, let's have a crack at it and see how we go. So th this bloke, Reverend Thomas Bayes, came up with this idea of conditional probabilities. And conditional probabilities are actually how you spend your whole day. You know, this, this is what we intuitively do. Um, but one of the dramas around p-values is it's based on something called a conditional probability. Um, conditional probabilities are really complicated. That's actually a conditional probability, and it's a proof that one plus one equals two. But the guts of this is that we need to know the difference between a probability and a conditional probability, and that's kind of the um, the jargon for it. P given A is a probability, but P of A given B, that's a conditional probability. What the hell do you mean by that? Right, so let's take a couple of examples. The probability that some randomly chosen person lives in Qatar is actually very low because there's not many people who live here in the whole world. That's not equal to the probability that someone lives in Qatar and they also work at Aspatar. Basically, almost everybody who works at Aspatar also lives in Qatar. We've got a few people who fly in and out. Now, this is the bit that takes a little while to get your, um, your head around. That's not the same as the probability of people who live in Qatar. So, um, Craig, in your case, let's say, well, up until recently, probability that somebody lives in Melbourne and works at La Trobe is not the same as somebody that works at La Trobe lives in Melbourne. Now, the key part is you can't, there's nothing you can do that lets you take this number and figure out that number. Those things are completely independent. Just store that one away for a second. So probability that there's a difference given that there was no difference. This was what we were talking about before with that whole, what the null hypothesis is based on. That tells us nothing about the probability that there's a difference given that there is a difference or this is where we usually live. I want you to tell me that there's a probability that that difference we saw is real given that I don't know if there's a difference in there or not and we can't get in between it. So the example that I like for this is I'm always losing my locker keys. The main spots my locker keys could be, they should be living in my backpack. Occasionally I leave them in my locker and you know go about my day. They might've been left on my bedside table, they could be somewhere else. <clears throat> so the biggest probability, if I know nothing else is, they should be living there in my backpack. Maybe I left them in my locker lap, maybe I left them in my bedside table. Some new information comes up. I've just went and had a look in my backpack and they're not there. So the probability that my keys are in my backpack, given that I've just had a look and they're not there, has to now become very low. Maybe I had a boy's look, but chances are it's in one of these other spots now. So that shifts the probabilities, you know. But there was no way for us to get from A to B without finding out that new information. So long way to get around. You, when some new paper comes out that says low level laser therapy is actually really good at wound healing, you've then got to first of all say, hang on a second, how likely was that before I knew anything else? Do you think that was very likely, very unlikely, or more or less an even bet? Because the p-value is actually a conditional probability. So if you think it's a long shot that laser therapy actually makes a difference, and you're saying, look, I reckon there's 19 chances out of 20 that does not work, and the p-value comes out as 0.05 or 0.01, your 5% has gone up to 11 or your 5% has gone up to 30. And what people usually say or think at least when they say, you know, significant effect for laser therapy on uh, whatever it was, diabetic ulcers, oh, that's it, it's real. Well, now hang on a second, mate. If you thought this was unlikely to start off with, I still now reckon it's nine chances out of 10 it's not, or at least seven chances out of 10 it's not. 
if you thought it was 50-50 to start off with and you do the same thing, well, now we're up to, we went from even money up to 70% or 90%. And if you think, look, this, this one's probably right, you know, whatever is a good treatment for diabetic ulcers, I reckon it's nine chances out of 10 it's right. And our p-values come out, well, we've gone from 90% up to 96 or 99, depending on what our p-value is. So that's the mistake mostly that people make is that they stop back here with p-value and they think, oh, well, that means that there's a 95% chance. And it's, it's, a, it's a weird thing that happens with um, inductive reasoning that I'm probably going to leave it there because everybody's going to be dropping off this straight away. <laughs> but do not take it that p equals 0.05 means that there's 95% chance that the thing you saw is real. You have to be able to say, and this is why clinicians have to be front and centre. So before I read this paper, I thought this thing was very likely, very unlikely, or you know, whatever else the case may be. This new information came about. Now this is how far it shifts my thinking. But it has to shift your thinking. Look, I really didn't think that that thing was gonna work. P-value said that, so I've gone from this almost certainly doesn't work to this probably doesn't work. Okay, now I'm waiting for the next paper to come out. Mm. Perfect. Um, con confidence intervals, Rod. Someone messaged yep. me and sort of they were they wanted a bit of clarification on those and and what not just what they mean, but how would they guide someone's thought processes when they're reading about them and they're trying to sort of infer something from them. Yep. Um, confidence intervals are a much better step in terms of um, reading papers. So the co the confidence interval is kind of like the best estimate for what this group should be. And so typically we'll take that as, uh, usually it's, let's say it's normally distributed so we can take the average. So we've got a whole bunch of men and we took their height. And so we'll, do we, you know, list everybody's height? No, no, we'll just take the group average. But then the confidence interval says, look, this is, if I was to randomly pick a bloke out of that sample that you had, he would be this tall from here to here. And that's your 95% confidence interval. So um, uh, actually a better example for this uh, might be, here we go. Let's again bring this across. So if, you're, if people are interested in this stuff, um, go over to this, this website here. Can you see up in the top there, the URL? Um, our psychologist, actually, can I send that to you blokes as a message? Yeah. Yeah, in the uh, chat, well, you'll see the, at the bottom of your screen, you'll see the chat, and I can link to it. Uh, righto. Sorry, mate, I can't see that. Oh, hang on, here we go, chat. There you go. So I'm just going to send a link to there. Yep. So this bloke, um, I reckon, has done an awesome job, Christopher Magnuson, of giving a whole bunch of um, visual descriptions of different things. So this thing that I'm about to play now, so let's say that we'll take a um, uh, we'll take a 95% confidence interval. So this is we're 95% sure of how tall um, this person's going to be. He's just taken the sample mean as being zero here, but you'll get the idea. Uh, and let's play this. And now he's going to run the experiment a whole bunch of different times. Now we'll speed things up a little bit here. Whoops, let's just slow down just to uh, good. Right there you go. So these are individual experiments where we went out into the street, we grabbed a whole bunch of men and they were about that tall, but that's their 95% confidence interval. This tall, this tall, this tall, this tall, this tall. This true population, by the way, has a sample mean of zero. So if we were to sample absolutely everybody, on average, they're zero. But in this little sample that they got here, they got one time, they went out and did it, and another time just here where the 95% confidence interval didn't cross the sample mean. So We've ran 149 studies and it only missed by two times. So we've actually got, um, in this case, we're doing a little bit better than what 95% should be. But over the long run, 19 times out of 20, that 95% confidence interval is going to include the sample mean. But you'll see a lot of these dots are to the left or right and very few of them are exactly on the center there. So just when you're reading 
average and 95% confidence interval. Just bear in mind that this is what you're actually seeing underlying that. So this is the sampling distribution that they're looking at. This is how many guys are. Mostly they're clustered over the center here, but you know some of them are spread down there. And if by accident you just happen to have chosen a whole bunch of blokes up from the right-hand end or from the left-hand end, your dot and that sample width like there. Oh, look at that. That's a good one. So here we go. This is so one two, three, four, five, six. So let's say we were really unlucky and we just ran six of these experiments. We know that the real answer is it should sit in here somewhere, but out of those six experiments, two say it's less than, one says it's more, and only three says it's on there. So if we were to not do replication studies, we might get a really biased opinion of you know, the height of men when you're walking around the streets here in Doha. But if you do these studies for a long enough period of time, look at that one. Two standard deviations south, nowhere near crossing. So, but, but so that's it, the but guts it, of an ICI. A, a large part of the problem, Rod, is that there's, there's no mileage in doing a replication study. Absolutely. And this, this is a, an annoying bit um, because, and again, this is why I want to get clinicians into research because clinicians don't really care if they publish a paper or not. You know, it's nice to do and all the rest of it, but their job doesn't live or die by it. Their job lives or dies by treating people with sore feet or whatever it is you bludgers do. <laughs> but mm. the person who lives in a university, this is, and now this, I'm going to annoy some people here, but if you work in a university, you only get a promotion if you get papers published or you bring funding in. And basically you bring funding in by getting lots of papers published. And so it's not in your interest to not be out there and doing lots more papers. Well, how do I get my papers published? So to get into the sexy journals, you need to find something exciting because nobody publishes a study, unfortunately, they should, but nobody publishes a study which says, yeah, these blokes found the same thing that everybody else found. But that kind of study says, actually, you know, we can now start to trust this finding. What they want to hear is this is the sexy, exciting new thing that we have. And so what that leads to, uh, let me just see if I've got this here somewhere, is this thing called publication bias. Uh, apologies for the delay here. Where... Because they, um, because it's only the sexy, exciting things that get published, all of the things that actually don't matter to, oh, sorry, all of those replication studies end up not getting uh, into the different journals. So when you pull all of those papers together, all of the ones that came out on the negative side, you know, which might well be an important part of what's going on, they don't get published. Uh, apologies, I... Oh, here we go. Let's just try this one. Uh, so that's Ioannidis. So yeah, it's good. Here's an e acupuncture example again. Um, so this thing's uh, called a funnel plot. And the guts of a funnel plot is how it should work is on the y-axis is some measure of study quality. So for better or worse, one measure of study quality is how many people you have in your sample. When you've got hardly any people in your sample, uh, what should, uh, what happens is exactly like we were doing on that thing there, the confidence interval is going to be wider and wider. So you might be over here on the left side, you might be on the right side. If we were doing these trials fair income and publishing everything else, everything that was out there, we'd have an equal number of studies over to the left-hand side and to the right-hand side of where the real effect is. And it turns out that the real effect for acupuncture is essentially zero. But you can see there's a big bite taken out of the left side of this graph. And the reason for that is because all of these negative studies, they're pretty hard to get published. To come out and say, we did a big randomized trial into some treatment and it didn't show anything. Well, that's not very exciting. Journal editors don't get happy about that. You won't get any funding doing that kind of stuff from big needles. And so that stuff doesn't get published. Yeah, that's how it should look. Yeah, actually, I'll just I'll just stop your share, screen share and share mine. Um, I don't know whether you followed this story. This was a um, editorial in Nature. Um, go forth yes. and replicate. You know, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So, so Nature were advocating it, but I don't know whether you followed this website, um, Retraction Watch. And there's yep. a, a two really good two part story of someone trying to get a replication study published in Nature. <laughs> you know, it didn't yeah. work. <laughs> so yeah, it's. 
yeah, it's quite do, fascinating to follow it. <laughs> yeah, do as I say, not as I do. Yeah. But look, the the journals are a business as well. You know, they are in it absolutely to make money. And if the people consuming the journals, you know, which is basically us, start to say that, oh, look, these journals just keep publishing stuff that says stuff we already know. Mm. That's actually a good thing because we could actually be confident of that stuff mm. or it might start to toss out some of the rubbish where, you know, well, maybe that's not such a real finding after all, but yeah, yeah. you know, if it bleeds, it leads. Sure. Uh, Rod, one thing I definitely want to get your take on is the concept of uh, the power of a study and particularly its sample size. Cause what we see a lot, if someone uh, sees a study that's been published and the, the conclusion resonates well with them and fits their bias is that they'll often use how many, how many people are in a study, uh, purely sample size, to either say, yeah, this is this is good, we can trust this because it had 200 people in it, or if it's a yep. study they don't like the report, don't like the conclusion of, they can say, well, there was only five people in it. So could you yep. could you give us uh, your overview of, of sample size and, and power? Yep, yep. So you're right that, um, let's share again. So uh, just we'll go back to our 95% confidence interval. And this one was being ran with a sample size of 10. Um, so you watch the effect as we, let's bump this up to, oh, hang on a second. Did I just crash that screen? Uh, I'm just going to kill that conditional probability one. And we'll get this guy to refresh here. Um, so as sample size goes up, you're getting a, a, a truer and truer estimation of what the real um, sample mean should be. Uh, that one looks like it may have died. Oops, that was your paper. Let's just pop this on here. <clears throat> yeah, don't know what happened there. All right, so here we've got a sample size of five, exactly the same thing we were talking about before. And you can see now the lines are wider and wider. As we make the sample size get bigger and bigger, and in fact, let's, for the sake of speeding things up, we'll jump up to a sample size of 50. And you'll see now that the lines either side are starting to get smaller and smaller than they were up to the top there. Or if we jump up to 90, whoops. Now we're going to get smaller lines again and that are going to be clustering closer and closer to the true mean so yep definitely one of the things um, that you should be looking for is that the bigger that the sample size is the more you can trust that group estimator so you know the group average whatever it was that they were looking at because the noise either side of it the 95 percent confidence interval is going to be closer to that real number than when we only had five people in the study so now those lines go wider and wider. So what's that actually mean for you? <clears throat> so remember we talked about having those two, um, those two populations. Uh, so the null hypothesis says that there's no difference. And so we've got one population here that's centered around a zero difference and we've done some intervention and these guys are 0.2 standard deviations north of that. If we wanted to look at the effect of changing the power on this, if we drop from 196 people down to let's say only 14 we'll reset the zoom we can now see that those populations overlap an awful lot more so even though we say that on average this group is 0.2 standard deviations north of this group now there's an awful lot of guys who are inside this that are to the left of the guys who are inside our null hypothesis group. Um, and so that says in this case, because of the difference in the overlap out here, you've only got 12% power to, de to detect an effect size. Long story short, as you up your numbers, this amount, which is the power, which is the bit north of the group mean differences starts to get larger and larger. Now I've got 50% power by having um, sample size of 96 with an effect size of 0 0.2. So one of the things people should take home from that is sample size is going to give you a truer estimate of what's going on. Um, but if, you're est if it turns out that your effect size is big, so we'll drop back down now here to 20. And let's say we have something that's actually got a really big effect. So we're going to see one standard deviation difference from time A to time B. Even though we've only got 20, now we've got power of 99%. Mm. 
So it's both <laughs> the sample size and it's the size of the difference. And in my caper, that's why I'm saying, look, thing one, let's look for how big the difference is. Because yeah. if the difference is small, stop there. Yeah. Right. So that's your, your D is one place to start. How many standard deviations? But then you have to go and say right now, does that actually matter for my patients? Because if it doesn't, you know, if your effect size is down here around in the sports science caper at the moment, they're saying, you know, we're chasing the 0 0.2 because an effect size of 0 0.2, that's what really matters. Well, sports science, you've often got sample sizes of about eight or 10 per group. And that's why our sports science stuff and a lot of our stuff, to be fair, is wildly underpowered. You've only got a 9% chance of detecting an effect there. Yeah, sure. That, that last point is really, really good, Rod, because you often, and especially in social media, you'll see people um, don't like the results of a study. So they'll say, oh, the sample size is too small or someone might like the results of a study and they don't care that it's only a small sample. And I keep saying, I, the, the sample size is not something I actually put a lot of emphasis on. <laughs> you can go straight for the effect size and look at the sample size later. I mean, it's the it, yeah. it, people's worldview seem to influence the, of what they think of the um, sample size because it may or may not support their belief system. And that's a problem. <laughs> Yeah, fully agree. You know, everyone, uh, we love to um, to share our biases. Uh, I'll just add this one in here. So this is this guy, David Colhoun, who's made this false positive risk calculator, which is, I think, um, a, a nice way to go. So one of the ways that what he's saying is, and because most of us can do this, usually the paper will give you the p-value. Um, and then what you might want to be able to do or sorry, what we should be doing is saying, look, given a p-value and what was your prior belief in how real this thing might be? So we see a p-value of 0.05, let's say. Um, do you by any chance remember the numbers in that, um, that diabetic foot ulcer oh, study? No, I can't, sorry, no. Uh, right, yeah. No, it doesn't matter. Let's say there were, let's say there were 16 um, in each sample and say it was a moderate effect size. It's 0.5 standard deviations. And we have to now pick a prior for how likely we think that this is a real effect. Now, this is the, the bit that's hard, but it's actually fair. And everyone goes, oh, you can't, how are you going to choose your priors? You're just making that shit up. And that's right. But this is what we do every day. And this is my strategy for doing it. So your possibilities can go from zero to 100%. So this is the stepwise thing that we're going to do now. So I'll take, I'll get you two blokes to vote on this until we get to some sort of consensus. I'm going to start off with 50, 50 that laser therapy helps, um, laser therapy helps diabetic foot ulcers. Now, do you guys reckon it's more likely than 50% or less likely? And how confident are you? I would say more likely, you know, more likely, but not that confident. <laughs> Uh, so, so you 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 think it's more likely than fifty percent that laser therapy helps? Yep. Yep. You okay with that, Ian? Because this is not my caper. Uh, yeah. I don't know this area. It's it's not uh, really mine. Um. So I'm going to go with Craig. Yep. Yeah. Right, <laughs> let's go more. I'm, right I'm more, but I'm very very unconfident. <laughs> All right. So now we have to shift it up to point seven five. Yeah. So do you reckon it's more than 0.75 or less than 0.75? Or you say, look, I'm going to have to stop there. I yeah, can't guess I'll anymore. Stop, stop there. Yep. Right. Yeah, so stick, we say I'll that. I'll stick as well. Okay. So we're saying that there's a 75% chance that this thing is real, knowing nothing else about it. And we've got 16 people in each sample. So what we can then say is that the false positive risk is there's 10% chance, even if your p-value is 0.05, that that is a false positive result. Mm -hmm. Now, usually in our caper, when you know extraordinary evidence comes out, it needs, uh, sorry, an extraordinary claim comes out, you need extraordinary evidence. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes when these things are much less likely, and let's say it was only 10% likely, then the false positive risk, even though the p-value is 0.05, p equals 0.05, that's 75% chance that that's a false positive. Mm -hmm. So the other way for you to flip this around is you'd have to believe if you say that that's, if you think that that's likely, we've got to figure out, let's say 0.9, we're probably going to get close, uh, 
eight five. Okay, that's close enough. For this to be real with an effect size of 0.5, a sample of 16, you would have had to have believed that that was an 85% chance that it was real to end up with a, a false positive risk of basically 5%, more or less. Mm. So you'd had to have come to the table saying, look, I'm 85% sure this thing works for that study to have come out and you can you know plug your stuff into this calculator and figure out what the false positive risk or you can go around the other way you, you can use it an easy way to do it is to calculate the prior for a given false positive risk and a p-value so deserve p-value false positive risk number in each sample i mean it, it feels like everything has come back to the importance of, of even coal-faced clinicians understanding effect sizes better do you is there is there a is there a, a gem of a paper you can you can guide people to on that or a chapter in a book? Or where would you suggest someone who, who perhaps is listening to this and they've never even heard of an effect size before? Where would you right. send them to start their, their self-directed reading? Um, so reading's hard. <laughs> start here. <laughs> play, play, play with um, this interactive one just here that I'm just going to send you to. And again, it's the, the wonderful... Christopher Magnuson, I don't know this bloke, you know, he doesn't, I don't know him beers or anything, but he's made these lovely interactive um, graphs here. So this one in particular is a nice way to interpret Cohen's D, the effect size with an interactive visualization. And you can change the size of Cohen's D. So we'll go up to, a, you know, a medium effect size. And then it has a whole bunch of different things underneath here that are useful for you. So let's say we saw a Cohen's D of um, 0.5. What's the chance? Well, it's about a 63% chance that this treatment is superior to that treatment. Um, this Cohen's U3 is actually, um, uh, it's not a bad stat, but people don't report it terribly much. But it says, look, 69% in the treatment group 69% in this treatment group are going to have a higher score than the people in the comparison cohort. So if I did this compared to that with an effect size of that big, 69% of them are better than the guys that you were comparing this to. And in this case, we're comparing it to no effect whatsoever. So that still means about 30% of them are going to be worse off. So that's a nice way for you to get a handle around. Okay, well now tell me about what this treatment is. Is it, it costs me $100 a throw and I need to do 12 of these. Now I need to be able to sell that to the patient that looks seven times out of 10 when I do this to people, they actually have an effect. They, it actually works. Three times out of 10, it doesn't. Do you still want to plonk your cash down for that? Um, another way to look at it, which often gets published, which I find a little bit harder to explain to patients is I'd need to treat six people to get one of them better with it like that. And the percent overlap is about 80%. But you can play around with this effect size, drop it in there for the study that you've just seen. And, you know, again, this is why I'm saying maybe the, um, the small effect size that people are saying, look, forget about p-values, just go for an 0.2. Well, geez, 0.2. 92% of the groups overlap. We've only got 57% of our treatment group is better than the other group. We're only 55% sure that this is better than the other one. And we need to do this for 16 or 17 people before we can say that's better. How many of these conditions do you see? How many would you be willing to do? And, you know, 15 of those, we're not going to make any difference. But you then got to weigh it up. Is this curing someone's cancer? Well, Somebody with cancer might say, I'll take those odds. If this is, oh, I have a little bit of a pain in my foot every so often and it doesn't bother me terribly much, well, I don't know that that's a big sell, but it's going to come down to the patient in front of you. Mm. And if, you, if you're into that, then there's a whole bunch of papers that these guys point to. But look, honestly, I know your main job is being a podiatrist and you don't want to be spending hours on this, and I'm with you on that. It's, this is just nerds like me who... Mm -hmm. Don't look at pornography. This is the kind of stuff I look at. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure what would be worse. Um, so, you know, we're getting into the realms of, uh, of numbers needed to treat. And another um, anagram that, that people often see is the MCID, the minimal, minimal clinically important difference. And given that yep. we, you know, we're trying to keep this as clinically applicable as possible, um, 
could you just give it? I know we're, we're pressed for time, but just to yeah, wrap yeah. up, just just close up on that. Yeah, look, the the guts of the MCID is essentially it's the noise um, plus the amount that matters to the patient. So um, uh, so let's have a quick. The amount matters to the patient, to you, to you know whoever it is uh, that we actually care about in this regard. Um, so we we talked a little bit before. Maybe this is because we're in a bit of a rush here. We've done some study and we saw some change, and that study might be made up of a real amount and amount of noise. Um, and so what we need to figure out is this amount that's noise and this amount that's real. How big is that bar? How far does this arrow have to get before the patient, the clinician, the government, the whatever says, yep, that's fair enough. So we were talking a little bit before about our, um, our case of, let's go back to the pain example, because that's a common one that people often grok. Uh, so if we jump now to... Ba -ba 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 -ba. I don't get to show you my Gracely study, which is a real shame. But that can be for another day. Um, where was that? Where have I done here? Apologies, guys. Ah, oh, yeah, here was our pain study. Right, so this is where we need to be. So let's say we said that um, for the moment, let's just presume that um, this pain scale is exactly perfect. There's no noise in it whatsoever. So then we'd have to say, well, look, for somebody with a baseline pain of four, so that's the diamonds on here, these guys say to be minimally improved, they want to be one out of 10. Now, do we think minimally improved, much improved, or very much improved is what we need to be at the end of this study, given whatever the intervention is? You know, dry needling, having an operation, being given a, um, a pamphlet. And with all of those different kinds of treatments, you might say, look, to go to all the trouble of having an operation, I want to be very much improved. If my pain starts off at four out of 10, then I need to at least be three out of 10 better before I'll say I'm very much improved. My pain starts off at nine out of 10, you better be making me seven out of 10 better. So drop down to about two. So that's how much matters to the patient for very much improved, for much improved or minimally improved. So that's one part of the change that we've got to have. And then we have to say how much noise is there in this measurement thing here. So somebody would have to do the study of keeping people's pain levels exactly the same somehow, test them at one time, test them at another time and find out how much noise there is. Let's say for argument's sake that that amount of noise was one out of 10. So now we've said, we're doing a study on people whose baseline pain is five out of 10. So that's the square boxes here. And we went and asked all the patients and all the governments and they said, look, for this intervention, they need to be much improved. So we've got to make them three and a half out of 10 better, but there could be one out of 10 noise. So now we have to get over the hurdle of three and a half plus one is four and a half out of 10 for these people whose pain starts off at five out of 10 before we can say, this treatment was worthwhile. So that would be our minimum clinically important difference for that treatment. So the, the amount that matters to the patient, so you've got to get the patient front and center and the clinician and how much noise is there in the measurement. So back to our strength example, when there's 20% noise in the measurement, and then you'd have to get out of the coach or the, the athlete or the whatever, how much of a change would you have to see before you'd say this training program is worthwhile? Usain Bolt might say 0.1 of 1%. I might say 20%. So there's 20% noise in that test plus 20%. You've got to get me 40% better before it actually matters. Uh, and that's an important one for us to get across to to people because that puts the clinicians back front and center because clinicians are the best people to say, this intervention you're talking about, having an operation on your foot or putting an orthotic in or telling people where this shoe versus that shoe when the person was going to go and buy a shoe anyway, they all have different downsides. And then you've got to weigh it up in terms of um, the relative upside to the two of them. 
Perfect. Craig, I know you're yeah. you're always worrying about time. Have we got time for one more question? Yeah, yeah, one, no, more keep, keep, one more comment. One more comment, more. One more. It's from at it, 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 it's from Atoll. Rod, you'll be pleased to hear. And he said, while we're talking about sort of statistical probabilities, there's even money that you are delivering this talk wearing a pair of board shorts. Ethel's <laughs> 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 a better Ethel's a better gambler than he is a podiatrist, let me tell you that. <laughs> Uh, oh, unless, unless there are uh, unless there are any question, questions come no. through, Craig, I think we can wrap up there. No, I don't sure. think that can, no, seeing I... Rod's legs is that's it that <laughs> for the night now. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think on Control that note, yourself, Ian. I think on that note, there's, we, we've had we've had a lot of people watching. A lot of people have joined this late. So those of you who have joined late um, in about 10, 15 minutes, hopefully Facebook has rendered this video and you can replay it. I will put it up on YouTube later on today, um, and then the podcast version will be available. So, so thanks, thanks so much, Rod. It's been a really good. It's it's gone well over an hour, and um, oh, thanks, shit. mate.